leading and partaking in excavations, especially in the state of Kedah in 1957. The history department in the university then was actively, deeply involved in a number of archaeological projects. Kenneth Tregoning, Wang Gangwu, Alistair Lamb, D.K. Bassett, I can't imagine D.K. Bassett tromping around on archaeological sites, who were all our teachers in history, among others, were frequently featured in surveying, excavating newly, recovering earlier sites explored by H.G. Quartridge Wales before the Second World War. These were developed in close association with the Raffles Museum and the Museum Department of the Federation of Malaya. Lengthy reports were compiled and published. These consisted of cataloging artifacts and materials that were retrieved, describing sites in detail, drawing foundations of buildings and site plans, and reconstructing histories of local settlements, as well as proposing regional connections or affiliations. Sullivan wrote one such report. It was published as Excavations in Kedah and Province Wellesley in the Journal of the Malayan Branch of the Royal Asiatic Society in 1958. It was extensive, covering 31 pages. He begins by locating Kedah as a vital site in the polities in the region while busily connected by trade with other power bases across the Bay of Bengal. He then proceeds to methodically describe work undertaken in a number of sites. Artifacts and material fragments are listed, described, and occasionally illustrated, photographically and graphically. Site plans are drawn, indicating orientation and measurement. All the drawings are by Sullivan, displaying facilities he developed as an architectural student in the 1930s. As a report, it is lucid and meticulously set out. I am not competent to appraise this or any field notes compiled and published by Sullivan and leave assessing the status of his involvement with archaeology to those better placed to do so. What I can say is that his involvement fed into the museum. From his 1957 expedition, he assembled a number of artifacts from excavated sites with the consent of the Kedah State Government in an exhibition in the university's art museum. He gave public lectures on this and other archaeologically related subjects. He traveled to Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, forging connections with museums, archaeologists, collectors, and collections, and prospective donors all for developing the University Art Museum. If the, <clears throat> if the region was unknown when he arrived in Singapore in 1954, he set about familiarizing himself with it by entering it. It affected his scholarship, though. His new activities rivaled, competed with research into art of China. No, he did not set China aside but it was difficult to continuously cultivate the home base of his scholarship and to do so as a premier site. China was not accessible. Sullivan, along with Cohen, revisited it only in 1973, 27 years after leaving it in 1946. It was, <clears throat> it was difficult too during his tenure here because Malaya was in the midst of armed conflict with the Malayan Communist Party, whose principal patrons was, the communist, was communist China. Singapore was deeply affected by and drawn into this conflict. Links with communist China, for whatever purpose, were untenable. During the years in Singapore, Sultan published five articles on Chinese art. The majority of these were derived from reworking his doctoral dissertation, which is a familiar enough phenomenon. His principal attention, though, was on the region of Southeast Asia, chiefly on the art of its traditional past. On leaving Singapore in 1960 and assuming a lectureship in Chinese art in the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, 
he redirected all of his resources to China. He published The Birth of Landscape Painting in China in 1962. Numerous reviews of Chinese art exhibitions held in institutions on both sides of the Atlantic and of books on Chinese art, along with articles on topics as varied as ceramics, bronzes, and painting, followed prolifically. In 1965, there appeared notes on early Chinese screen painting. In 1971, he delivered a paper titled Possible Sources of European Influence on Late Ming and Early Qing Painting at an International Symposium on Chinese Painting in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. They were groundbreaking. The National Palace Museum became the wellspring for scholarship on Chinese art, especially painting, spearheaded by historians of art from the USA. Within a decade, between 1960 to 1970, Sullivan was recognized as a scholar of stature and firmly established in the field of Chinese art history. Southeast Asia receded and faded. Besides occasionally publishing material that he had worked on during his residency here, Sullivan did not write on art in this region freshly and significantly. For that matter, he did not visit Singapore until 1996, 36 years after leaving. Even so, <clears throat> he regarded the work he had produced during his tenure in the university here as important enough to republish it in two volumes titled Studies in Art of China and Southeast Asia in 1992. He did so, no doubt, in order to reinsert himself in the art scholarship of this region. Although the region faded from his academic horizon and disappeared from his scholarly resume, it continued to prevail in his thinking, in his teaching, and in his life. It must have done so for us to make sense of Jerome Silbergel's admiring recollection of Sullivan's, and I cited it earlier, extraordinary breadth, even among teachers of his generation, there are few with such range across geography and media. It may sound as though I'm bidding adieu to Sullivan, but not yet. A little bit more needs to be said. When reporting <clears throat> on Sullivan's archaeological involvement, I remarked that it fed into the university's art museum. Objects were selected, acquired, and loaned for display via his connections with the region's archaeological circles. Sullivan's writings on ceramic vessels was, for instance, spurred by artifacts in the museum. The scope of his research, however, was not restricted by, by what was in it. He combed the region's collections and beyond, both public and private, corresponded with museologists in India, Japan, and Europe in developing his publication. The University Art Museum was, in turn, connected quite widely. <clears throat> the study of Kendi, a vessel with a sprout, may be regarded as displaying some of these traits. It was published in 1957 in the archives of the Chinese Art Society of America, quite a prestigious platform. Um, we have, this is a page from that article, and we have circled that candy because that's the one in the university collection. And also to, to show how he, he designed the display. He didn't single out any one, any one item, but set it all as if it is in a gallery for comparative, comparative viewing. <clears throat> Sullivan begins by dealing with the etymology of the term candy, then proceeds to describe its formal properties in considerable detail, noting differences. By comparing vessels with a wide range of provenance in Southeast Asia, China, and Japan. He illustrates this aspect of his study, I beg your pardon, Transformations of shape and form are carefully described, although explanations for alterations are not offered. Sullivan forwards chronological schemes. He speculates on the use of candy by using current uses, but avoids saying how it was used in particular circumstances historically, which in any case may not be decidable. 
He consults existing publications widely and sharply. He illustrates his study profusely, so much so the candy from the University Art Museum is crowded out. He includes a hand-drawn illustration, this is by him, of types of candy arising from his study. We have a blow up of the section on the right. The premises in his study have been undoubtedly superseded by advances in recent scholarship. Even so, at the time of its publication, it was the most thorough and extensive treatment of this type of vessel. Not all of Sullivan's written representations of art in Southeast Asia are interesting or worthy. The discovery of Angkor, published in 1960, after his departure from Singapore, relates standard narratives of the French discovery of a lost civilization. Sullivan occasionally disrupts such conventional accounts by referring to sources other than those routinely used by French writers to underline that there were other kinds of remembering. It is written largely in the tone of a travelogue, probably as a guide for visitors. Uh, I leave discussion of his, of his writings on these aspects of the region's art by reminding myself and everyone that what I have presented is cursory and spotty. Sullivan's publications during his tenure here need to be examined closely in relation to other clusters that make up his body of writings and in, and in relation to contemporary writings in and of the reason. There is much to do. I make one more observation and then you'll be relieved to know, move on to concluding this account. The art museum was recognized as a significant cultural site. Within three months of its inauguration, about a thousand was recorded as having visited it. For an exhibition on Indian art in 1959, consisting of sculpture, painting, and fabric donated by the Indian government, the list of invitees reads as a who's who in Singapore, and apparently all of them were present. A measure, <clears throat> a measure of the regard of the public had for it may be gleaned from the following. On July 27, 1957, the Straits Times reported that a reader was miffed by an earlier remark by Frank Sullivan, another Sullivan, a journalist who was quite deeply involved with artists and art in Singapore and Malaya, and who played an important part in advancing the modern year. This other Sullivan had said that there were no collections of art in Singapore and there was no art that could be viewed regularly. Well, this, this miffed reader is quoted as saying that contrary to Frank Sullivan's opinion, there is, and this is the quotation, an excellent art collection, collectively representative of leading exponents of Malayan and regional art in the University of Malaya art collection. Ahmad, 300 cheers. This reader is quoted further as saying that there is in this university, in association with the art museum, a department of history of art. Sullivan may well be seen as a department. It happens too. This museum, its collection and exhibition programs have been reported in the daily newspapers. One has to read these and notices published in other sites in order to ascertain the reception of this institution at its founding. When talking about the setting up of the art museum, I listed four aims. In realizing them, a collection was to be assembled with the following categories guiding it. Contemporary Malayan art, Southeast Asian art, Malay and Islamic art, ceramic art from China, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Donations and acquisitions at times dilated these categories. They were not developed evenly. The procedure was slow, gradual. The scope for collecting largely affirms prevailing tenets of traditional art, with two exceptions. Firstly, collecting ceramic wares from Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, and the Philippines was a new enterprise. 
enabling explore, exploring new museological and art historical fields and archaeological as well. And then secondly, there is contemporary Malayan art. And I'll talk on this a little. As students, we encountered the collection regularly. This is the interior of the museum then. I've been able to identify the prominent people from their rear view, <laughs> which often is the best view. Yeah, OK, we got somewhere. We use the study room in the museum routinely for working on all, our, on all our other courses. It was a haven. The collection was displayed by grouping objects by medium, material, and provenance. From time to time, there were exceptions to these arrangements. I remember seeing pictures painted in oil and ink by artists from Singapore hung adjacent to ceramic vessels and partial images of the Buddha cast in bronze. This is not how it was displayed, of course. All I've done is to reassemble the pictures which were in the collection and that sculpture in the collection then, just to signal how I recall the images that we saw at that time. This is Chen Chong Sui's uh, Kampong by the Sea. That's a painting of landscape by Lim Hak Tai, an oil. And that bronze image is from Thailand of the late 16th, early 17th century. They were hung adjacent to ceramic vessels and partial images of the Buddha. It was exhilarating. There was nothing like it anywhere else in Singapore, as I recall. It was part of our daily student lives. Among categories for acquiring works is one designated as contemporary Malayan art. Sullivan esteemed it highly, as it revealed, in his words, the state of our cultures. His view was that students should know not only what was, but be aware of what is, culturally and historically. He was actively involved with artists and art in Singapore, with organizing exhibitions of their works, not dissimilarly from relationships he forged with the new modern artists who gathered in Chengdu while he was residing in China. Works by artists such as Lim Hak Tai, Chen Chong Sui, Chen Wen Si, Chong Su Ping, Liu Kang, Chua Tian Ting, yeah, it's, a, it's an all-male cast, no? were acquired through donations and purchase. Lok Wan Tho and Malcolm McDonald, the chancellor of the university, were among the most active donors. Sullivan installed Chong Su Ping on a register apart from other artists, writing on him more frequently than on any other artist, regarding him as the most innovative, imaginative, and as having immense effect. Here he is assessing this artist comprehensively, and I quote, Su Ping's influence on the younger painters of Singapore has been powerful and direct, perhaps too direct. His angular figures, formalized portraits, and expressionistic color are the mark of a highly sophisticated painter the very consistency of whose style has given rise to a school of young painters who copy his forms and colors just as the painters in Paris have copied Picasso and Braque. It resonates critically and historically. Su Ping's art is described swiftly in formal and psychological terms. His impact is recognized forcefully and judged not necessarily as conducive for furthering creative practice. His status is assigned as historically eminent and affiliated with master artist traditions in world art. I have not come across a published opinion on Su Ping in the 1950s that is comparable to Sullivan's in sharpness and scope. Cohen was busily involved in conversations with artists and in dealing with transactions for acquiring works from them. She could speak in dialect, thereby easing and facilitating relationships along a variety of pathways. And she was appreciated. So much so, Su Ping is seen in one instance painting her portrait as a tribute. 
This is in his studio, and that's the finished work which is in the Cohen and Michael Sullivan collection at the Ashmolean now. This is quite common, the, the, the relationship between artists and patrons and artists and fellow artists on both professional and social levels. Sullivan's commitment to artists and art here peaked in 1959 when he assumed the chair of the first Singapore Arts Festival in that year. He was its director and curator of its visual art program. This matter is largely forgotten and needs to be examined, as so many things are forgotten. For the present, I underline that in directing this festival, Sullivan is seen as immersed in the worlds of art here and as a leading figure, giving those worlds shape and momentum. He, in turn, signals his immersion significantly in what he says. This affiliation did not emerge in 1959 suddenly and with this festival. While he names artists as being from Singapore, he envisions and represents their creative work not as Singapore art, but as Malayan art. Not as Nanyang, but as Malayan. In fact, I have not encountered the term Nanyang in any of Sullivan's writings. And here is another matter that needs some thinking. The fullest testimony that he pro provides to substantiate this this thing called Malayan art, is in an introduction that he published for an exhibition held at the Victoria Memorial Hall in 1956. It is titled, Ten Years of Art in Singapore, 1946 to 1956. It is a fascinating and important text that needs to be read closely. I summarize it to further this presentation. Sullivan identifies three attributes distinguishing artists and art here, in and from Singapore. Firstly, it has vigor, as it is youthful in every way. Secondly, it is of its time and place, expressive of the land and its people, and not formally or stylistically derivative. Thirdly, it is universal, in the sense that the art that is produced is not entrapped within specific cultural, ethnic enclaves, even as it is created by individuals who are identifiable as belonging to specific cultural, ethnic enclaves. Artistic creations breach, cross over, stereotypical classifications. Hence, he says, one does not need, and I quote, to know Malay as a language to appreciate works by Suri bin Mahayani, or to be conversant with Hokkien to understand Cheong Su Ping. This art, Sullivan says, and I quote, is the most successive expression of Malayan culture, and so on. There are many assertions along these lines. Some are modulated by observing formal attributes, while others are accentuated by drawing attention to the symbolic tenor in the works. Malayan, as it is employed in this introduction, is a term that signifies collective, integrative, and even unifying tendencies or principles. What is Malayan? We need time to handle this question, so I'll be brief and speak on it broadly, descriptively, and largely from my recollection. The term Malayan signified not so much necessarily a, delim a delimited location or a boundary place. It was that, but not only that. It was an ideal, an aspiration, a destiny. It was a real hot term in the late 50s and early 60s, appearing in tandem with moves towards political independence. As an undergraduate, I was, like others, swept up by forces underpinning it. On one hand, it heralded, it heralded the shucking off of colonialism and striving for a free, self-determining destination. Malayanization was, for instance, a strategy by which colonial officers were replaced by local staff and for enhancing local capacities and abilities. Malayan, on the other hand, carried with it cultural assertiveness and creative distinctiveness, spurred by calls to be sharply aware of one's time, place, and living experience, 
concretely and commonly. Malayan also generated prospects for devising new forms of language for representing reality. Malayan resonates as modern as well. The university campus was a vital site for debates on the present and future of Singapore and its people and for representing visions of Malayan. It was not completely rosy either. Neither did Malayan command support unanimously as there was resistance and deep-seated anxiety. Still, it was proclaimed vigorously and insistently. Sullivan was not the only one who envisaged Malayan as an artistic ideal or as an artistically identifiable trait. Marco Su, for instance, published his reviews and views on art as art in Malaya. And there are others dealing with theater, literature, architecture, fashion, food, film, and so on. On this note, it may be surprising to hear a testimonial from a political and national perspective. Here it is. The exhibition of Indian art held in the University Art Museum in 1959, mentioned earlier, was opened by Lee Kuan Yew, who was sworn in as the first prime minister of a newly constituted self-governing Singapore in that very year, 1959. His opening address at this exhibition was remarkable in many ways. Here is a passage that is pertinent to our brief discussion of Malayan, and I quote, perhaps exhibitions such as this should inspire some historian to rewrite our history, not in terms of empire builders, but from the standpoint of a Malayan nationalist. Malayan was influenced by the Indian, Malay, Chinese, and European civilizations. These are now subtly blending to form a Malayan culture. In that short paragraph, Malayan is repeated four times. Sullivan published his short essay, Highlighting Art as Malayan in 1956, three years earlier from uh, uh, the speech by the late Lee Kuan Yew. We are not here dealing with who uttered Malayan first or before whom. We wish to underline its prevailing use its summoning of heightened conviction and belief along a number of fronts. A, sl a small but significant observation. In writing 10 years of art in Singapore, Sullivan employed the pronoun we and our. He refers to our painters, to our culture, and recalls situations when we debated something or other. In doing so, he stamps his writing with affiliations with communities here, personally, a stance that is startling today. These are not, I believe, forced. They are not, I believe, affectations. During his six-year residence here, Cohen and he appear deeply involved, personally and professionally, with artists and art here. Kenneth Tay, an assistant curator at the NUS Museum, and Lucas Lum, an intern, have assisted in preparing this lecture. I appreciate their help. They are at the back manning all of this, and their company immensely. We discussed a number of matters over these past two months. One such topic sprang from considering the collection in the University Art Museum. They asked extents to which Sullivan used it when teaching the history of art. I would say he used it indirectly and informally. In tutorials, when he used objects from the collections to spur hands-on approaches, we were excited by these close encounters. It was a fledgling collection. Resources for developing it were extremely modest. I imagine Sullivan not considering what was in it as a collection suitable to teach introductory survey histories of art that conventionally dealt with masterworks and that represented history as a tradition of masterworks. 
The situation may well be different if courses in history of art were taught at higher undergraduate levels in years three and four, but this was not to be at that time. Still, we were stimulated by, by what was in the collection, by our regular contact. What's more, we regarded ourselves as special and in a very special place. Kenneth and Luca were also keenly interested to know extents to which Sullivan dealt with the modern, the modern in Singapore in his lectures. Did he, for instance, talk about Cheong Su Ping, whom he regarded highly? I'll have to be direct in replying this. He did not. The modern from anywhere in Asia was not featured in the two-year history of art course. Is this surprising or puzzling? Perhaps it is when it is viewed from the present day and from today, where we seem to be awash with the contemporary and the modern. But we are dealing with situations in the 1950s and until the 1960s, 70s. But then, even today, the modern and the contemporary in the art of Asia are not altogether prevalent in academia, in the halls and corridors of departments of history of art. This is a fascinating topic deserving a separate attention. The survey course on European art, for example, that, that I attended when studying at Berkeley in the early 1980s, stopped at the end of the 19th century, effectively with Cezanne and the post-impressionists. The only 20th century artist we glimpsed at was Picasso, and that was because he was Picasso, one of a kind, a kind of an ahistorical phenomenon. Historians of Asian art did not admit the modern in its teaching and writing. It was looked at as alien and did not exist. Ananda Kentish Kumaraswamy, for instance, dismissed the modern as irredeemably antithetical to the true tenets and principles of Asian art. Historians teaching and writing Asian art in Europe and the USA have tended to treat the modern in Asia as derivative. At best, the modern could be handled separately from and outside of the canon of art history. The study of traditional art in Asia, on the other hand, conforms to that canon and is therefore admitted and represented in it. I have set the situation starkly so as to make some sense of Michael Sullivan's treatment or non-treatment of the modern in the field of history of Asian art. Sullivan was a teacher of history of Asian art all of his professional life and in departments of history of art in universities. He's acknowledged as an important source, if not an authority on the modern in Chinese art. He has published on it. He never taught the modern in his entire life, not formally. During his tenure at Stanford, three candidates completed their doctoral dissertation on the modern in China under his supervision, yet he never taught it. I'm sure there are other similar instances. Sullivan was not, to my knowledge, has not said why he has not. I describe his stance as ambivalent. There is no doubting his interest in modern artists and art. Yet he was not convinced, in my view, that he or anyone else had sufficiently studied or treated the modern in art historically in order to represent it rigorously, methodically, and consistently on the basis of bodies of work that are stably consolidated in ways that were comparable to writing histories of traditional Chinese art. His writings on the modern sprang from intimate observations, personal friendship, conversations, and judgment of works that he could view periodically. They are, as one assessment regards them, more like first-person reporting rather than text-object-based research, yielding patterns of deep connection in time and space. They could not be, in all probability, for him, translated into providing stable, curricular-based courses for teaching at undergraduate levels. 
His publications are undeniably useful. They furnish recordings, perspectives, and viewpoints of artists, artworks, and art events that appeared in public in particular circumstances and as he witnessed them. As useful as they are, they were not enough for talking about the modern in art with deep historical interest for him. These aims were developed continuously, confidently, and authoritatively in the treatment of traditional art in China. The majority of Sullivan's writings are in this sphere. The ambivalence towards the modern ascribed to Sullivan, especially when relating to the canon of art history, is not particular to him. It is not easy to breach institutional fortifications, to do so within one's own mind and professionally. Here is a confession by a renowned scholar and teacher relating obstacles he confronted when leave, leaving the mainstream and peering into the slipstream, James Cahill. It is also a bitter complaint leveled against the very institutions that he for so long shaped and commanded. In the preface and acknowledgement of one of his last publications titled Pictures for Use and Pleasure, Vernacular Painting in Hai Ching, China, in 2010, Cahill writes, and I quote, the theme of this book and materials it treats are mostly new to scholarship and were art historically impenetrable until the paintings could be assembled and considered together. That task has required years of looking, looking through old, dark corners of museums, which is where these are stored. The writing of this book has drawn me into areas of Chinese studies where I was not entirely home. And here comes the complaint to the publisher. The book was essentially completed by late 2002 and was ready to go into production when the project was scuttled, mainly by the incoming director of a university press. The same press, University of California, the same press kept my book on for separate consideration, but firmly rejected it on the base of lukewarm reporters by, in parentheses, I believe, badly chosen reviewers. Don't we know that? It was rescued by Deborah Kirschman, assistant director of the University of California Press, who he makes a thousand salams to, has my deep gratitude. End of quote. For Cahill, the vernacular sits like the modern for Sullivan, ill at ease, at the doors of institutions. I realize this is somewhat melodramatic and really needs to be handled much more subtly and considerately. Even so, I have said it in this way to underline the complicated perception or appraisal of the modern in Asian art in the academic study of the history of art, at least in the case of Sullivan and to extents in Cahill. When describing Michael Sullivan's stance as ambivalent, I'm not suggesting that he might be, might be conflicted in pursuing his professional life. He was an, he, his was an equable disposition, largely unruffled and cool. He may be seen as navigating the two streams, i.e. the great tradition and the modern, along which he thought and wrote on art sufficiently clear-eyed, although separately. We are touched by a kind of wistfulness, even by a mildly deprecating humor, when hearing Sullivan appraise himself, and here it is. Compared with American scholars of Chinese art whom I greatly admire, I seem to have come into the field sideways. That has the advantage that and he's never forgotten, especially after my years in Singapore, where I became immersed in art and archaeology of Southeast Asia and the Philippines. I had a broader background than some of my American friends. On the other hand, they were trained more thoroughly in the discipline of art history. They had better command of Chinese and were altogether more professional in their approach. 
I have a sense that some of them looked at me as something of an amateur of the old school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. T.K. Sabapati. I think, thank you for the illumination, for the depth, for the deeply personal account of Sullivan. I think there are leads and directions that perhaps will uh, take us to many, many possibilities here. Uh, right now, as a gesture of thanks, uh, may I invite uh, Joseph Mullinix, Deputy President, Administration of the University on stage, please. May I invite Sabapati on stage, please. Sabapati. At this point, uh, to end, uh, we would like to invite everyone to this preview uh, over at the museum, uh, as well as importantly to make the evening complete, food, refreshments, and some festivities, I hope. Please, thank you very much.